the metaverse is what we created to be. It can be the sum total of all of our dreams and all that we want to see in the future. It can be the protopian idealized space we want to create in reality. And it can be the place where we test out those ideas. So whether you're interested in games or work, digital twins, enterprise collaboration, just creative play and artistry, music, theater, all of it finds a place there. And right now is a great time to experiment with how you can create value with others. Get your own ideas out and maybe do some really interesting experiments, do a little R&D on your own and test yourself. But also think about how you can connect with others, collaborate and maybe make something that is bigger than all of us. Evo Haining sits down with John Radoff in this fireside chat about the metaverse. Evo Henning is a creator, interactive showrunner and producer, CEO at Playable Energy, a brilliant thought leader on many aspects of the metaverse, but particularly around AI, virtual beings, and avatars. Let's jump into this fireside chat. We are getting ready for another fireside chat about the metaverse with John Radoff and Evo Haining. I'm going to let you guys take it away. Hey, Evo. So glad you could be here. Hi, John. Great to be here. This has been a, a journey and it's great to see you today. Yeah. And just to give a little bit of background here for people who are tuning into this, I met Evo in the virtual beings group over on Facebook and she posted this pretty amazing message about the evolution of artificial intelligence, virtual beings, machine intelligence. I'm not gonna read the whole excerpt here, but you compared it to mushrooms, crystals, kittens. I just loved the metaphors and I was like, I have to get her on a video and talk about this stuff because to me, the metaverse is this convergence of an, a lot of trends. It's creativity, it's artificial intelligence, it's the immersiveness, it's all those things coming together. I mean, maybe we can start there. Like, how do you conceive of the metaverse, this term that everyone's throwing around? Mm -hmm. So I like to picture the entire digital universe, and that includes many different manifestations and ways of exploring. So we have that VR metaverse that we've seen in, in the, the sort of Snow Crash Ready Player One kind of storylines. We have the layers of the metaverse we understand through augmented reality, right? So a snap layer on top of our photos. These are our layers of metaverse experience, the same way something like uh, spatial audio on WebXR. That can also be these sort of nested, immersive, and interactive layers that forms something that is not just a 2D web. Obviously, like we're moving into not just a 3D web either, but a multi-sensory immersive web. So what do you add all of that up into? What does that create together? Well, that's the metaverse. That's this universe of potential, basically. What creative potential we hold together. I, I love that you included spatial audio in that description because I've told people on like the social audio platforms like Clubhouse when I when I've jumped into some of those chats I've been like this is the metaverse too this is this is part of it um, I'm I'm curious how you think of that Well so within my work at Open Metaverse Interoperability we are working on those layers of the experience and we start at the bottom and we start with ethos and governance and how do communities hmm. actually connect at a fundamental level. And then we start talking about infrastructure and communications layers and creativity layers and how all of those things come together to form stacks, right? We understand what the, the web stack has looked like up to this point. Now we're talking about a multi-dimensional web stack and audio plays a role in that. And obviously things like uh, how we share assets, the transactional layer. So that's where crypto and NFTs fit into this entire multi-dimensional approach to exploring the digital landscape. Awesome. 
So I, I want to talk about mushrooms and kittens and mm -hmm. light and yeah. nature mm -hmm. as, a, as a description for intelligence, because I think a, a lot of people think about machine intelligence, they anthropomorphize it on the one extreme, or it's an algorithm to show us advertisements on Facebook at the other extreme, like help everybody here understand like the different ways that we might think about intelligence and the role that that will play in the metaverse. Sure. So um, I'm a creator, I'm a storyteller. And almost 20 years ago, I started creating a world. And that world takes place in a near future where our intelligent ecosystems are a part of our everyday lives and we live with them, we live within them. And so I began thinking about, well, what makes up a computer today? It is mineral, right? It is not necessarily animal, it's mineral. And all of those, let's say, if you look at a quantum computer, the, the gold and all of the different elements that come together have specific properties. They act in specific ways. So if you take that and, and make it bigger and begin to think about, well, what could a biocomputer be like? And how would that be different from the types of computers we work with today? Because right now we understand computers to be very much this sort of boxy, right? Most of our devices are, are these boxes, right? Or they're flat screens and these sorts of things, but they are not necessarily thought of as organic. Um, we're moving toward a much more organic understanding of computing and of intelligence. And that's intuitive. And that's something that we participate in because we're already a part of that natural world that's intelligent all around us. Hmm. And so I began thinking about, well, okay, we have computing networks and we have mycelial networks and we have a matrix of crystals. And each of those have fundamental properties that are uh, perhaps in cooperation, like a, like a symbiosis, right? So what would biomimicry applied to the metaverse look like? How could that grow entire new worlds? And, and what would that look like in a term of like play? Could we bring people into those environments and maybe generate and, and evolve them together? So I began creating that framework and a series of stories called Manor Meta back in 2005. And so I went into Second Life to build these giant crystalline intelligent structures, thinking that I could maybe, you know, it, it was early days of AI and I wasn't able to really bring the sort of intelligent objects to life that I had wanted to see because I could see that AI doesn't have to be an individual, like a persona or an avatar, uh, an intelligent ecosystem is also a form of AI. And there are lots of ways in which we may be living within AI in the future. And so our relationships to these things are really important. The way we relate to an AI right now in terms of sort of algorithmic bias and all of these sort of regulatory conversations we're having in, in the public commons right now, those are going to set the framework for how we work with the natural world, the natural computing world, right? Because just as you and I are having a conversation, we're going to be conversant with a wide number of AI in the future. We already are. And so as we begin to take a look at that broader ecosystem and the role we want to play in it, right? We yeah. are cooperative beings. We, we like to work together and we're interdependent beings too. Yeah, I, I love the idea that we can expand our understanding and explanation of just intelligence. So when you mentioned like fungi and mushrooms and stuff as a form of intelligence, a, a friend of mine once said, hey, Bitcoin is actually a form of intelligence. and and. To be clear, I'm, I'm not sure I totally buy it, but his, his case was this. It was like when there were first flowering plants back in the Cretaceous period and plants kind of formed this alliance between insects and mammals and spreading their seeds around. That's kind of like Bitcoin to him. Bitcoin and there, other people have created this metaphor like Bitcoin's the mycelium of money. And Bitcoin is actually the intelligent thing and we're out there kind of 
serving it <laughs> by adding energy to the system. So I, I think it's probably not quite right in my opinion. I'm curious about your, your thoughts on it. But what I like is the metaphors in terms of maybe how it helps us think about the problems, think about the connections between computers and machines and, and just different ways to challenge ourselves about how to build out a lot of these systems. I think what your friend is also pointing to is that the collective has some sort of consciousness of its own. And it mm. maybe isn't about the individual Bitcoin as an intelligent actor in an ecosystem <laughs> as much as the intelligence of the collective is evolving toward very specific things. And it's, it's testing ideas around decentralization, obviously, but it's also testing ideas about sharing and, and what we value together. So you were talking about decentralization. Yes. You were also part of an effort to try to make the metaverse a lot more interoperable. You talked about some of the structures we need to enable governance, maybe asset exchange. So to you, what is the role of decentralization in what we're calling the metaverse? Well, I think we got a very interesting, uh, life lesson in why decentralization matters when Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram all went down at the same time, right? Those who had all of their social graph and their contacts and their messaging tied up in those ecosystems all of a sudden could not reach their people, right? They couldn't make their plan. They couldn't do the thing they meant to do. Their businesses failed for that time. And so we see we're having a, a single point of failure create mm -hmm. all sorts of resiliency challenges throughout the commons, not just for the stakeholders, but for everyone else around them too. And so decentralization, um, to, to think of it sort of as a, a broader approach to resiliency, if you're thinking about millions of creators all sharing their stories in networks like, uh, like YouTube or Twitch even, right? So story-driven networks, uh, where the metaverse stories are coming into the public. Now you can imagine those stories are going to take on all sorts of wild uh, ideations and some of them may not be appropriate for all types of audiences, right? If you have just one central pipeline for media, then it's automatically going to cut out everything. Everything that's not appropriate for this audience, that audience, that else, right? What's happening is that we're seeing that niche communities each need their own types of media, right? So creator-centered communities have formed that are appropriate for these niche communities, right? And this has happened in queer communities for a very long time because safety matters, privacy matters, right? This is the difference between life and death. If you're a stateless person, if you're a refugee, if you're marginalized, you've already had to do this sort of hacking around the, the problem space, right? You understand why it's a problem. So basically all of the products of Facebook went down yeah. a couple of days ago. You mentioned three of them. Oculus was another right. one. A lot of people think of Oculus as maybe Zuckerberg's vision for the metaverse in terms of just being able to right. enter a virtual reality version of it. And it's, it's funny you say that because I posted this exact same thing on Twitter, also a centralized platform, by the way. But, you know, I posted that this really reminds us the danger of centralized systems when you build lots of systemic dependencies on it. So, yeah, I mean, it was an inconvenience to some people just to not be able to go and look at your friend's photos or whatever it is that you normally just log in for. But I think it's important to also realize that there's a massive business ecosystem around it. It's not just placing ads. There's a lot of applications. All of the online applications, for example, of Oculus all depend on being able to get into Oculus and be able to do a Facebook login. So there's a lot of businesses that are just completely dependent on Facebook being able to operate. So right. that to and, me- and extreme losses. That, that need to now be managed, right? How, if you've got that single point of failure, that's a huge problem. I thought the joke very funny was like, how do you, uh, 
you know, did people stay trapped in the metaverse when it, when it went down? Like, is it like a snow crash level situation? Like if you were in VR <laughs> in that moment, did you just die and you can't uh, do yeah. that? Right? All of those, those funny ideas about, but, but it's, it's quite serious. And I think you've pointed to this in previous articles around portable communities and, and a connected social graph, right? So the metaverse I want tells me where I can go find my friends all across these different platforms. And I can get some of that right now in Steam, but I can't get to a lot of that information. And it's certainly not enough to develop any sort of interoperable strategy, right? So we have to use Discord as our communications layer so that we can actually stay connected and have that portability that we're craving. So let's go back a little bit because you mentioned Second Life. What Second Life is trying to do a thing right now a little bit. They're like, hey, don't forget about us. We were we are the metaverse too. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I include them in my definition, actually. My definition is much more about trends and it's about the future of the internet, not you get to be included in the metaverse club or not based on <laughs> when you were made. So Second Life can be in the metaverse. But what what do you think the difference is between second life of then and maybe where it's going other than maybe the obvious which is that's another centralized platform but but where are we going from here and you were a content creator there so how is that going to change yeah i mean so to be clear i was a content creator there 10 years ago and that's when I, everyone was a content creator active so second life creator. <laughs> so i stay in touch with a number of the communities that i helped Begin. Uh, one of them, the nonprofit Commons in Second Life, is still active, hmm. and they still meet, and they've been meeting for 15 years. And so there are certainly like OG metaverse communities that are still robust and active, who are doing the the R and D, the experimentation, the university layer uh, work on accessibility, on again that that niche community service, which is very important because. Honestly, what keeps people coming back are those communities, right? Generally, we might have a one and done metaverse experience, like a concert or a big show, a festival, but why we keep coming back is generally because of the connected community that we find. So the communities that really understand that and, and Second Life was the earliest in terms of uh, a 3D community that understood the importance and value of the social graph and staying connected to it. And it gave users control to make their own objects and sell them, right? Mm -hmm. Which every other, you know, Roblox is, has taken off and, and really taken that model and made it available for kids. It made it sort of sanitized and safer for kids. Um, but they were the first ones to really sort of prove the model. Yeah. And, and all these centralized platforms, I don't want to talk about them as if they were bad or wrong or anything. I, I think that decentralizing all these features is actually super, super hard. Like that just takes a big investment, a lot of coordination, a lot of pieces that work really well. The original internet, you know, was built on fairly simple by today's standards anyway, building blocks like the domain name system is decentralized. And then came along the World Wide Web, which is inherently decentralized for the most part. Um, but then stuff got harder, right? So then you had people trying to build e-commerce websites. So you eventually end up with like a Shopify to make that super easy so you don't have to build Amazon.com by yourself or web authoring systems, for example, like, you know, now we've got Squarespace and Wix and things like that. Creative tools to layer in and to begin to again, build that sort of multi-dimensional world from these 2D concepts into 3D and 4D. Yeah, but a lot of the, the common property of a lot of those things is that their focus was enabling creators and also trying to just figure out what their economics would be around that so that they get paid for creating that environment. And you end up with like either call them walled gardens or company towns around around content instead of the decentralized web. So in the more 3D immersive space, you've got you had Second Life, now we've got Roblox, you've got a lot of things like that. Right. So it's kind of repeated itself again. And, and I'm wondering what is what are the pieces gonna be that we need to, to actually enable people to kind of control their own destiny, own their own creations, own their own worlds even within an internet that's going to get more and more real-time, more immersive? 
so there's there's a handful of fundamentals that need to change. Um, my colleagues at Open Metaverse Interoperability have been working on changes and 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 really updating the GLTF spec. And there's some interesting work happening at that layer. Uh, so uh, for those who aren't familiar, GLTF is basically like the the 3D JPEGs, if you if you want to sort of take a picture of that in your mind, um, these multi-dimensional assets are what we share between, uh, let's say, NFT markets or between metaverse platforms. Now, if you're an artist of 3D assets, you might upload to Sketchfab so that you can resell your work across multiple, you know, ecosystems. Or you might do an NFT in Mint and, you know, do some sort of limited edition release, however you choose to, you know, generate value or, or attention on that. Um, but they're not portable. Almost none of these assets are like print once and done. You're always like iterating. So let's say I publish a piece of art to a virtual world. I might still have to go back and tweak it many different ways in order to mm -hmm. re it to a different virtual world. Uh, the artists who did the uh, Bernie Man multiverses, for example, spent hours just working on the shaders and the interactivity uh, because that portability of assets isn't easy to do yet. So there are absolutely things around uh, using WebXR and, and potentially aspects of the NFT uh, market to deal with that problem. And there, there are great experiments happening in that space. We're going to do some demos on those within OMI later on this fall. Um, so specifically, you know, how do we use the open web to share those assets? We're starting to see, for example, NFT galleries where you can then go buy the asset you want and then bring it into the world you want. And you have permission to do that. Right. Um, that is that's an early stage right that's the individual mm -hmm. what does that roll up into with collectives and with paired programming and generative art tools well that's updates to metadata and how it how how is fractional ownership tracked um so there's a number of different experiments in in fractional ownership basically and then there's the um the other side of it the publishing side of it and webxr has not a great on-ramp right now. So right. how we publish to the open web is going to fundamentally change in the next year. We've seen some great examples of what that can look like. And I think we're going to you know, continue to see like the NFT market has been a generally flat 2D market up until this point, except for the, the Somnians, the Decentralands. We're starting to see much more of a 3D and 4D approach to these markets. And, and a lot of people listening to this or watching this may not even be familiar with WebXR, so we should just take a, a moment on it. Um, would you care to just what, <laughs> well, what's the story uh, on WebXR? And I and I feel like I, I'm not an engineer and I'm not the best qualified <laughs> to do so. But um, as as a creator, when you hmm. are developing for the open web, you have sort of limited options at this stage. Um, if you're a VR creator, for example, you're going to be generally working within a game engine, like uh, the work you're doing, John, working with the Unity uh, game yeah. engine. Um, however, it is often like you're, you're stuck within specific publishing ecosystems. By publishing using WebXR uh, straight to the open web, you can overcome some of those uh, sort of silo boundaries. Um, and make your work more accessible. So in education, for example, we published a piece a couple of years ago. Uh, it's at wild-cacao.org. And that's a tour to the Amazon to see where your chocolate comes from. It's an educational piece. It's 360. It's an interactive piece oh, wow. that's designed for kids. And it didn't make sense in one particular marketplace. It wasn't money-driven. It, it was funded by a, a public uh, third party group in order to do an educational piece of work. And so we don't even have great distribution networks for these things yet. I think we are going to see uh, when we talked about DAOs and decentralized work, decentralized media networks and decentralized metaverse media is where we're headed in terms of how do we own our own media together and create value there. Yeah, and and I want to talk about government governance and DAOs and all that stuff. Um, let's let's go there next. So th I've had a couple of conversations 
in this series with thought leaders around the metaverse already. And it's funny, DAOs and governance has come up the two other times as well. And I suspect a lot of people are just really curious about it. So just high level, a DAO is DAO, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Now, when I've spoken to Amy Jo Kim and Raf Koster, they, they had, you know, kind of a similar set of opinions on it, which is number one, that it's governance isn't a technical problem. I think they they both agree to it's it's more of a social problem, but also that they were skeptical of these kind of systems being adequate or helpful for managing like things at the complexity level of like an online game world or something like that. And I'm not so sure because I, I just, here's my own opinion on it. And I want to really hear yours, which is, first of all, having a DAO doesn't immediately mean turning over total authority to everyone who just happens to have the DAO token, which gives you voting rights. You can establish what you think the appropriate governance is, whether that's the ability to vote on proposals, whether it's only certain kinds of proposals, whether it's electing a council of elders that help advise, but it's not, you know, it, it's not like you start to hold these tokens and you get to have a say in every single thing that goes on, like at the level of say a designer working on something, for example. So I, I feel like we just need to really explore the space in terms of what DAOs can do, how you structure things. And it's very experimental right now because actually people haven't been doing this for very long. Um, but I don't have the negative reaction that it's somehow opening up Pandora's box of everyone's going to thwart like game designers and world building in, in these settings. So any, what, what are your thoughts on, on this? Because you've spent a lot of time thinking about all these things. <laughs> I, I think we will need a hybrid approach for the foreseeable future. Obviously, there are things about the Web3 and DAO movements that are essential and are really important to deal with breakdowns in governments and breakdowns between sectors as well. Now, that includes making sure that one company doesn't have full dominance over the field. And so some of the issues around uh, antitrust can even be approached through a DAO-based approach. Now, uh, just to step back, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization can be sort of held by many, many people. And those stakeholders are given different levels of participation. And each group gets to decide how much that participation matters, right? What are the decisions the group gets to make together. And, and you're right, uh, for now, we haven't seen as many like fully decentralized DAOs. We're seeing this sort of uh, give, the, give the community some autonomy and then perhaps put other aspects of the autonomy within another sort of uh, independently held and that, and, and that can be an AI, that can be any number of things. And so, these sort of paired programming approaches where you see the community of stakeholders having a role, the advisory or the people who actually created a thing having a piece of that puzzle too. Um, I'm very excited for how this can change ownership because I think we gave away too much of our creative ownership, especially if you look at the last sort of 10, 15 years of social media, we gave away most of our value, right? We just sort of openly just sort of shared all of our videos and our stories and our assets and our art. And we just sort of did it. Like it was fun for a yeah. while. And then like we we're doing that. now, giving half, giving half of the zero revenue that this will produce to YouTube. Right. But. <laughs> right. And then we realized that, oh, wow, they capitalized on our data and maybe in ways that, that, that don't feel good to us, right? So reclaiming our own value includes things like self-sovereign identity. And this is one of the things we work on within open metaverse interoperability is how do we implement self-sovereign identity across metaverse platforms so that I can maintain control over my own data, my own environment and my own creative work. Because right now, if I go into certain platforms, I give it all away. I don't have a choice. And DAOs do provide some way to mitigate that, but only if they're designed to do so. 
And so whether we see or not, like autonomous organizations that respect sort of the, the quality and the, the value of the individual creator, as well as the whole sort of market, um, that remains to be seen. I, I don't know that that's what's going to happen yet. And I think it's important to keep asking the tough questions about, does this engagement add up to the thing we want? Or does it just create another sort of money-driven approach that forgets about the humans in the process? Well, that, that's a question. What, what happens when you blend together the idea of creators collaborating and whatnot, but also people who want to just maybe not be the creators, but just participate in the world and live in, in various worlds and then create essentially a economic incentive around it because DAO tokens usually have a value and they're traded and some people are just speculating on the DAO token. They're not just there for the governance rights. So how do you think that dynamic will play out or, or without predicting the future necessarily, what are the, what are the risks or issues with that that you see? I can, I can give you one example from my story world, right? So mm -hmm. in that world, you can have different levels of participation. You can be a full character holder and have a full character that is embodied that you can come in and participate with and on. You can be more of an audience member. So participation mm -hmm. doesn't have to be like in the middle of the story. Participation can be like, I'm a part of the walls, I'm a part of the environment, and maybe I make certain things happen. So I'm like, uh, I'm like the guy behind the walls at Blue Man Group who's talking to you through the tubes, but you don't know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. You play with those sort of layers of interactivity and permission and give people different permissions to play. So we did this in an AR game that I designed, but we, we didn't put it forward after playtesting we did a project around intergenerational play using sort of a Niantic Pokemon Go-like dynamic using uh, seeds and gardening and permaculture as the goal uh, and, and the reason to collaborate. In that game, it was called Seeds the Game. Uh, this was uh, seven years ago now, early AR. Um, we had grandparents, master gardeners, and teachers creating the challenges for the young players. Hmm. That intergenerational play where they are actually being challenged by other people in their community up to the stakes and it made it far more fun so that they were all being incentivized even though the incentives were obviously uneven, right? So you can really play with intergenerational play through these dynamics. Layers of participation where everyone holds one piece of a collaborative stake in the puzzle. All right, so you, you reopened the door to characters a little mm -hmm. bit more around playing the role of characters. Yeah, AI has always played a role within computer games. And one would say the games is sort of one of the dominant themes of the, the metaverse right now. So we've got this idea of non-player characters driven by AI. So we've kind of had the proto version of what some people are starting to call virtual beings. I was hoping you could maybe shed some light on that. What What's a virtual being and where are we going with this? What's cool about it? Hey, John, did you see the movie Free Guy? I haven't seen it yet. I want to see it, but I've seen the trailer. So I, ba I know the basic premise. An excellent example of a virtual being. Um, it is a story of a non-player character who comes to life in some form. And that evolution of intelligence from non-player character into a virtual being that people form a, an attachment and a love for, right? That has some real autonomy and ability to publish and ability to create. So we're seeing this again, this evolution from just the, the avatar as something that I embody and then act through, sort of puppeteering in the sort of second life mm -hmm. way, into uh, now we have obviously lots of VTubers and virtual beings who are maybe not a human inside. Maybe it's all AI, maybe it's a hybrid. Sometimes these lines are very blurry and unclear, right? Obviously lots of people are playing with Unreal and MetaHumans and doing things that sort of scan from the physical and put it onto the digital. Um, we're gonna see lots and lots of these types of sort of 
otherworldly types of relationships with these types of characters because they feel more real to us now. Mm. We begin to see each other in them. And so the relationship with them is going to change. I'm excited to see if this changes our narrative around things that are alien or foreign, because if we start to see ourselves more effectively mm. in what is alien or foreign, does that change the interpersonal dynamic? Are we more likely to feel connected or even friendly toward it? Very interesting. So th there's a couple of threads forward with that. One is just the AI, the machine intelligence that's that might be the mind or heart of, of a virtual being. There's also mm -hmm. the human controlled aspect of it. I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, Code Miko has made a, a huge movement around this. In fact, Josh and I were just talking earlier today. He was like, uh, hey, we should do a, we should do something in Roblox or a 3D environment. And I was like, sure, I'll get a Rococo suit and like I'll I'll control a virtual being. We can we can go all the way in. The thought that just occurred to me though is it's almost like what you described, the end point where the intelligence on the inside may not be a human. It could be a lot of things, I suppose. It could be a hybrid of all of those things. And we, we may not be able to decipher what's on the other end in the future. So all of these conversations and governance around black boxes and algorithms that are happening in public this week will also be applied to this space down the line. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just thinking now, the more and more code Mikos there are out there that are playing these characters and creating these experiences for people, so Code Miko will 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 issue some B roll here just so everybody sees what we're talking about. But Code yeah. Miko plays a character essentially on Twitch and has people come in to her channel and and responds to things and you can push buttons and make yeah. her do all kinds of crazy stuff and she interviews people. It, it's it's super fun. Just check it out. But now I'm thinking as there's more and more Code Mikos in the world, people going to start getting accustomed to relating to this virtual representation of a person or a being in the same way that I feel like we have gotten more and more comfortable over time with virtual property, whether that was virtual goods in an online game or the things that you were doing in Second Life or all these things that are happening in Roblox or even cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, NFTs, all that stuff. Like we have become very accustomed or at least the last couple of generations of people on the internet have gotten super accustomed to that. Now the next frontier is maybe virtual beings are something that they also just relate to and it will yeah. Will it become less important whether it's even a human? I, I, I think we are going to evolve to that place. So uh, shows like Alter Ego are going to become more and more about what the person chose to become um, and why, right? The, the hybridization is very interesting to people. Some people really like the choices that are happening behind the scenes. Um, but even in fiction and story worlds, uh, I mentioned the writing I was doing earlier if you can imagine nine human characters, multiple different types of AI embodied characters, animal characters, and other natural elements all in conversation together. Now, I think we're going to see more and more of these types of storylines where it isn't just real life and it isn't just virtual. It is the conversation between them and the dance between them that starts to unlock new things. And I think that's, collaboration especially. It's also pattern recognition, it's decision making and being more effective at things like disaster response and mm. doing things together that are really hard. And as a storyteller myself and someone who's made games, I'm, I'm just imagining the possibility space of I start with the world and I create a world and I bring these beings into it and I sort of unleash them and see what they're going to do. And it's almost a co-creation process with these virtual beings, as opposed to me having to sort of do at the detail level of absolutely everything. Right. Right. You're describing what I proposed <laughs> in 2009, which is why people looked at me like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you were way you were way ahead of your time. I think maybe back then people did not 
envision just how rapidly natural language just as one dimension of this comes along. So in the last three years, I did a graph up on, on um, my blog a, a few months ago, and we'll, we'll throw that up on, on the screen for everybody here, but it, it, we've gone up like a million percent in the last three years in terms of the number of parameters that go into these deep learning algorithms. What, what does that mean? Well, we've gone from natural learning algorithms that are really bad and you can just immediately tell it's a computer to now it can actually write stuff where you're not too sure whether it came from a human or not. In fact, you know, and a lot of times, sometimes it's uncanny valley. Sometimes it's pretty convincing. Like you could play a game like AI Dungeon, for example. Like you can tell uh, that there's some weirdness about it part of the time, but it's pretty. It's pretty interesting. And that's just GPT three, which is the current version right. of this. We're going to GPT four, which is like another order of magnitude, and it includes spatial logic, spatial understanding. How is that gonna? transform or at least that whole trajectory going to transform this frontier of virtual beings? I, I think we're going to start to see more conversations between the models, right? So GPT-3 mm -hmm. and 4 represent a whole way of thinking and, and modeling. And there are others, right? So having different personalities with very different voices and very different ways of putting information together and then putting them in conversation is going to create some very interesting ways of understanding the world differently than humans would have ever come up with. Yeah, and I, I get excited about combining this idea with the decentralization we were talking about earlier because there can be more than one world too. Like it, it ought to be possible to have a virtual being that plays with me, I don't know, it's probably against the terms of service, but plays with me in Fortnite and is my buddy in there, um, but also goes to a completely other world with me. And the virtual being has its own identity, existence, intelligence, relationship with me and my friends, independent of the particular game or world or whatever we're doing. That's beautiful, the familiar. And, and that, that concept of the familiar that that can go with you. I, I love that idea. And I can see where that would be extremely valuable, both as a, a way to store memory, right? Hmm. Because that's the other part that's not portable right now. Our communities aren't very portable on our social graph, but but also our, our memories. Like we're stuck to these sort of screenshots or, or video captures and things like that. And so um, I think there is absolutely a role for the, the familiar, the pet that comes across the metaverse and maybe, you know, can unlock doors for you where you can't unlock them yourself. Um, I think we start to see that fictionalized and, and uh, go see Free Guy because I think you'll enjoy some of the ways <laughs> that plays out. Um, there, there are these uh, utilities that are being developed to basically solve some of these problems from a infrastructure systems point of view. Um, but we have to remember what AI is really good at, right? Collecting lots of data, making sense of it, pattern recognition. There are certain things AI needs to be entrusted to hold for us so that we can do the hard stuff and, and trust each other to do that hard stuff together, right? The relationship building, right? If we free ourselves up of some of these layers of noise, we can actually do more on the interpersonal and the creative but we have to figure out how to sort of hand off and delegate the right things so that we can focus in on those important things. Yeah, and you brought back um, portable communities. It, it, it's an idea I wanna maybe get out there a little bit more for everyone. So first of all, I think that you can see a version of this inside certain walled gardens. So if I look at Roblox, for example, I think one of the things that's super powerful about Roblox, granted it's got walls around it and the games yeah. experiences you have there don't go outside of Roblox, but there's a lot that they've gotten right in terms of just making the authoring process super easy. One of the other things though, is the social relationships, the kids hanging out with each other, your friend group in there, you can be playing one experience in Roblox in a moment and just be like, okay, I'm done with this. Let's go do something else. 
And that's a virtually frictionless process to go from that one experience in Roblox to another. And for people that aren't super familiar with Roblox, the, the biggest misunderstanding is Roblox is not a game. Roblox is a whole environment for making games and experiences and stuff. And each one kind of stands on its own and, and people make stuff there. But I think that's super powerful just to observe how even inside the walled garden environment, how powerful it is to be able to either have the community or maybe not the quote unquote community that has sort of this ongoing identity, but even the sort of that immediate community, the group of 10 people that you just met in the game there, you're, you're off and doing something else. When people can do that online, I think that's going to be online, meaning outside of the walled garden. Right. I, I find that to be really tantalizing in terms of um, the possibilities for launching new products, games, experiences that, that are not so caught up in you know, these company towns where they're going to take a big part of it and try to control everything around you. I think we're going to continue to see more and more approaches to that problem. Uh, in our last interoperability demo night, for example, the team at Immerse Space, uh, Dulce was sharing how they're approaching it on the WebXR and open web side. Um, so basically like chess clubs, but then you can go to different chess rooms mm. and find your friends. And then let's go to the dojo and play instead of to the Alice in Wonderland and play. Um, so, but doing that to the open web with your social graph um, as part of this sort of um, next generation community, like almost like a meetup, right? I, I do think we're gonna start to see more and more of those sort of lightweight and simple things happening on the web, as well as in these more uh, curated and cultivated platforms like Roblox. Now, I love bouncing around in Roblox every once in a while. And I love that my friends in Roblox are ages nine to like 70. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing that really impressed me, that surprised me most was I, would not, I meet a lot of kids there, but I also meet a lot of parents and grandparents there. Oh, and uh, I think because of the nature of the way I create. So uh, for those of you who haven't used Roblox, there's a studio creator tool uh, inside of it. And it's like a solar system where you can make your own planets. So like Magrathia and the Hitchhiker's Guide, it's like you can just go and make your own experiences or games or whatever you want for that community. Um, so I made a Twin Peaks theme park. Right. And the people who show up at that are very different. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> and some people like Twin Peaks. And or some and people are very confused. <laughs> <laughs> what is this thing I ended up in? Yes, exactly. I, it's a good indoctrination. And, and honestly, Twin Peaks is a really good uh, analogy for portals in the metaverse because it, 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 it fictionalized a version of that. So it's kind of a nice way to begin talking about walking through a portal and going from one experience to the next. Now, Eva, as, as we're coming up on our hour here, I just want to give you a chance to maybe what is what is your big idea that you really want to either hammer home, reinforce, share with everyone here so that they can bring it into their thinking and maybe let it challenge them about the metaverse and this future of the Internet that we're stepping into? The metaverse is what we created to be. It can be the sum total of all of our dreams and all that we want to see in the future. It can be the protopian idealized space we want to create in reality. And it can be the place where we test out those ideas. So whether you're interested in games or work digital twins, enterprise collaboration, just creative play and artistry, music, theater, all of it finds a place there. And right now is a great time to experiment with how you can create value with others. Get your own ideas out and maybe do some really interesting experiments, do a little R&D on your own and test yourself. But also think about how you can connect with others, collaborate and maybe make something that is bigger than all of us. I'm excited to take all of those stories, those documentaries. I believe we're going to see a whole new boom in media from the metaverse and that it needs sure. to be owned by all of us. So that's where all of you as creators fit in because we are the media. We are the value, right? It's not held by a separate tech company. It's not in a server. It's in us. So 
we own it. We get to choose right now to take ownership of that and create it to be what we want it to be. Yeah, I love it. That That's a uh, beautiful thought. I hope it comes true. That's what I'm working to make come true. I mean, um, I see a future where, number one, you just have to make it super easy to create this stuff. And I think Roblox had the same idea, just make it easy to create stuff and let people create experiences and worlds and characters and all these things. But next we have to make it easy, but also able to control your own destiny. Right. Decide all- what. Yeah. Do you your work in mapping? I want to pull more into in the future, and this is something we're looking at at Open Metaverse Interoperability. Is how do we begin to make robust evolutionary maps of our field so that we can see how these things are connected, so that we can do some real needs assessment around interoperability, the gap spaces that we need to address, and then figure out how to collaborate and come together. So uh, any of you, you're welcome to join us at Open Metaverse Interoperability as omigroup.org, Discord, GitHub. Honestly, Discord and GitHub are the fabric of the open metaverse right now, and we invite you to participate in that. Yep. And we'll include some links in the show notes and, and we'll splash it on the screen here with Josh's magic powers that he edits things in later. So we'll get that in there. So Evo, it's been so awesome to have you here and hear all your thoughts. I, I hope this inspires everybody to not only dream about the future metaverse that we're going to have, but to get involved as, either as a creator or to shape some of this. Like It really is getting a lot easier to to create this stuff and, and play a role in it. And you doesn't have to be in those company towns who we're talking about. That said, if you want to create there, that's fine too. Just get out and create. Like, I think that's the most important thing, like express that part of yourself. So by the way, if you love this kind of content, if you like hearing from people like Evo, then, you know, subscribe down below and we're going to keep bringing those to you about once a week. We're going to have all kinds of thought leaders. You heard from Amy Jo Kim and Raf Koster so far. You heard from Evo today. We're going to have a lot more of these. And it's super fun conversations that I think are really going to challenge your understanding of what the internet is and what it can become in this metaverse. So Thank thanks you. so much for being here, Evo. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, John.